Welcome to session three of Northgate Church's membership class. Today is Monday, March 20th. This is uh, to recap the session that we had on Sunday, March 12th at 9.30 a.m. in our Sunday School course. As we've stated in each of these videos, the ideal is that you would participate in this course with others in a classroom setting, but for those who may have missed a week or two along the way, we want to make these available so that you can keep on track for membership at Northgate Church. My name is Matt Glidden. I'm the Associate Pastor at Northgate Church, and I'm going to walk you through this third and final session. We have a, a PowerPoint that we're going to walk through to do that. So far, in the first two sessions, we have seen that we as the church are called to preach, teach, sing, train, encourage, give, serve, love, edify one another, and don't forget, evangelize the whole world. So we sort of recap that way to make the point that our task is overwhelming. How can we get it all done? There's so much to do, and it seems like an impossible task. And we have, um, if you have your notebooks that you received during course, you, the class, you'll see this in, uh, in there. Um, and we've also got it on the screen for you. So churches come up with different strategies to get this large amount of work done. The, the worship of God, the edification, the discipleship that needs to happen, as well as the evangelization, evangelization and service that we are obligated to um, as we follow Christ. So the traditional view, and uh, I do need to do a little work cited in that a lot of this is coming from The Trellis and the Vine by Colin Marshall and Tony Payne. Uh, it's a wonderful book, and uh, we've edited a little chart that they have in their book uh, for our purposes here. So there are different strategies churches come at for this. The traditional view um, that we're going to go over here first would indicate that the solution for the best strategy is to hire a professional. And just to quickly overview this chart, you'll see that there are, um, at the, across the top, three views of ministry. They give us the staff and elder responsibility. Within each view, what is the church like? And within each view, the tends to result in, and then in the final column, the member responsibility. So the traditional view is like if you want to think of a just stereotypical church with a steeple, um, they've the staff and elders responsibility is to provide all services needed so we think boy we have a lot to do let's hire someone and the person that we hire then will provide the services needed for worship and discipleship and evangelism so when we follow out this model it turns out like a small corner store with one employee so it's kinda like we're trying to capture that classic scene that maybe you've seen in books or movies or TV shows where you need something, so you stop in at the little general store, and someone you know and knows you greets you, and you catch up on all that's going on in your life. They care for you, and then they go and gather what you need in the store, and they send you out, and you feel great because you and N had a relationship with the owner, and they gave you exactly what you wanted, and you went out happy. And that is sort of what the traditional view is, is pursuing, a small corner store with one employee. Well, when we approach church that way, that tends to result in consumers in maintenance mode. So if in that metaphor, that word picture we're painting there, the employee is the pastor, the elders, then all of those who attend church become like consumers who are in maintenance mode. So they come in to consume whatever it is that the person they've hired has for them to consume. And then they're constantly in maintenance mode. Meaning the responsibility of the church member is to hire the right professional and then support the ministry. Support the ministry through giving, support the ministry by frequenting the store, if you will. Um, that is the traditional view for how you would go about achieving all that the church needs to accomplish. A more common view in our contemporary society is... Uh, what we refer to as we plug members into ministry. So what we mean by that is if that is what we're going after, then the staff or elder responsibility is to share ministry roles with members whom you manage. And so as the staff and elders, they look out over the hundred or hundreds of th or thousands of people that assemble on a Sunday, and they say to themselves, okay, we need to not do everything ourselves as staff or elders. We need to share the ministry responsibilities with the people. 
And so uh, a church then becomes like a department store with numerous staff. And so we look out the, and this is honestly what I am inclined to if I don't check myself and remind myself that I'm actually pursuing this third strategy that we're going to put up there. Um, this is our sort of default mode is a department store with numerous staff. So I look out over the hundreds of people at Northgate Church, and if I'm not careful, I'll look out there and say, okay, the church needs someone to work in the children's department. So I'm going to recruit members to work in the children's department. It's just like a department store. I need people to work in the men's department. I need people to work in the women's department. I need people to work in the baby department. And so we're constantly recruiting so that we can have more, engage more people, yes, and share this ministry responsibility with more people, yes. But ultimately, we're not trying to get all the people plugged in. We're, we're trying to get enough people plugged in so that we can continue to provide what the consumers want the product the consumers want so that we continue to provide the product the children the people that shop in children's ministry want to buy and the people that shop in the men's ministry want to buy and so it tends to result in consumers in growth mode so we are continuing to give consumers what they want to consume and those then consumers are growing um, and we can stage it for growth the department store can get bigger and bigger and so if that's how the strategy is to do church then the member responsibility is that you have the responsibility to use your gift in the ministries that the church offers so here's the department store here are the different places you can plug into and then you need to plug into one of those places that's a common view for how people are doing church today what we want to do at Northgate Church though is a third strategy we want to equip members for ministry. So we want to train and equip members to be effective in whatever God calls them to do. That's the staff and elders' responsibility. So we look out at the, at the hundreds of people that call Northgate Church home, and our responsibility to them is to train them, equip them, you could also put in there educate them, to be effective in whatever God calls them to do. So we're trying to expand this beyond just our corporate gathered settings and say our responsibility to you as a church member is to train and equip you for all of the different areas that life calls you into or God calls you into in your life. So in that case, the church is not like a small corner store with one employee, nor like a department store with numerous staff. Rather, the metaphor we'd like to use is, is the church is a team with an active captain coach so we're all involved the metaphor we want to use is not one in which a handful of people is serving but that every single person that calls Northgate Church home is a part of the team and so we want to equip and train every single person to be able to live out the calling that is on their life and so we've used this as an active captain coach to try and just flesh out the metaphor so that we don't want to see staff and elders as um, coaches on the sidelines. We want to see ourselves out on the field with you, an active captain coach. We're all members of the team working together. And so hopefully we results in disciples in mission mode so that every single person in the church is not a consumer, is a disciple, it is trying to grow and help others grow. So we are being discipled and we are in mission mode. And so those, that's the type of language we'd like to use for what the result is. And then the member responsibility is to discover your gifting and calling and seek to become more effective. So if the staff and elders, if the leaders of the church, if we understand our, our ministry is to train and equip the members to be effective in whatever God calls them to do, then the, your responsibility is, okay, you've got to begin to understand what God has called you to do, what your gifting is, the passions he's put upon your heart, and then we will come alongside you and try to empower and equip you to live that out at your work, in your home, at your neighborhood, and your hobbies. And also, as we gather together corporately as the church, and we have children's ministry and men's ministry and various other things. But we want to have a bigger picture than just the one or two or three hours that we gather together. We want you to try to understand who you are and what God has called you to be. And so that we can help you live into that, 
so that you can be most effective as a disciple of Jesus Christ on mission to evangelize the world and make disciples. And so we feel like this is the most effective way that we can do all that God has called us to do, which can seem like an overwhelming task, but we will be the most effective if we can approach it in this way, equipping members for the work of the ministry. Not to mention the fact that it is explicitly biblical, as we have pointed out over the last two weeks, that the responsibility of the elders and the pastors and the leaders of churches is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So 1 Peter 4.10 is a good verse. As each of us received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. As a church, we want to equip our members to be good stewards of the gifts they have received from the Lord. Everything from money to passions to children to time to calling. And so we need to talk about stewardship. Stewardship is the underlying principle that I think will help us as leaders effectively lead the church and you as a church member to most effectively be a part of the church is to understand this underlying principle of stewardship, stewardship of your gifts and calling, stewardship of your family, your finances, of every category of life. Now all the slides that we're about to see come from a publication, a book called Visual Theology by Tim Challies and Josh Byers, and uh, it's a wonderful little book that puts some uh, ideas that are sometimes hard to understand into great illustrations for us. I highly recommend the book. It's called Visual Theology. The underlying principle, God owns it, I manage it. Everything in life, God owns it, and I manage it. You don't own anything. God owns everything. If God made it and you have access to it, you are a steward. And so that is applies to everything in life. Stewardship is the underlying principle for everything. You are accountable to God for how you work with what God owns, which is everything. So the question then, if we understand that principle, the question becomes how can I become or how can I be a good steward? And we believe that the answer to that question and this walk through in the book Visual Theology, is to focus on the gospel. Now, naturally, we ascribe value typically to money, and significance is directly related to wealth or material things. We live in a society that is just constantly barraging us with advertisements and um, materialism, and to place our value on things other than the gospel. So we believe that in order to be a good steward, we must refocus ourselves regularly on the gospel. And the gospel tells us that we were created in the image of God, but that we are broken and this world is broken, and we long to be as we once were created to be. And we understand that Jesus Christ is that promised one who brings restoration to our souls when we put our faith and trust in Him as our Savior and our Lord, and the one who brings ultimate restoration to the entire world as we look to the eternity future, the promises of heaven, and the new heavens and the new earth, and ultimate restoration. And so if we look, if we are constantly reminding ourselves of that truth, that our value comes from God, not from our material things, but from God Himself, that is going to be the most effective place we can start to understand what good stewardship looks like. We get our value from God, not from things, not from other people's opinions, not from status, not from power. Our value comes from God, our Creator, who loved us enough to create us, but also loved us enough to send His Son to pay the penalty for our sins and rescue us and give us a vision for the future. Seek wisdom is the second point. Our society is attracted to instant gratification, comfort, materialism. And we misuse our money, and quite frankly, we need wisdom. We need godly wisdom. We need to look to the Word of God to shape the way we think about all things. For example, the idea of stewardship. 
we don't actually own anything. That's biblical wisdom. And the Bible is full of wisdom for us. And so as we want to be a good steward, we focus on the gospel message, and we fill our minds with the wisdom that comes from the Word of God and the fellowship of the saints and the teachings of the church. We seek out wisdom. And then thirdly, we invest in eternity. We invest in things that are eternal. We want to be like God. We want to be wise. We want to be generous. We serve a generous God, and therefore we ourselves desire to be generous people. And so we invest our resources in eternity. Now, as we think about stewardship, naturally we just gravitate toward the idea that it's, it's about money. So let's go there first, and then after that we'll flesh out how it's really about every category of life. But if we just talk about our finances, it says in Matthew six nineteen to 20, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves and as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So within our finances and our money, we should be good stewards. And like we just said, investing in eternity, not laying up for ourselves treasures on this earth, but treasures in heaven. And as we talked about in weeks past, membership at Northgate Church, just to reinforce this, is not like membership in a country club or to Sam's Club or membership in most other categories you think of it. Your membership at Northgate Church is not attached to your contributions to the church. That's not the point we're making here. We're simply making the point that we serve a generous God and we will be generous with our finances and that you cannot ignore the clear teachings of Scripture that we are to invest in things that are eternal and spiritual. We also can't ignore the clear teachings of Scripture from beginning to end that those that love God make sacrifices for God. And sometimes in different cultures that looked like giving to the temple your sheep or your goats or your birds... And other times in the New Testament, it looked like Paul admonishing the churches to give to those who are doing the work of the gospel. But you can see throughout Scripture a principle clearly laid out that those who are following hard after God and have put their faith and trust in Him, they give to the work of God. We serve a generous God, and He wants us to be a generous people. And we have to make that point clear. Nobody likes to talk, well, I shouldn't say nobody. I don't like to talk about money. But you can't help, you can't ignore the fact that the Bible chooses to talk about money. And it chooses to talk about how we spend our money and what we invest in. And so it is important that we invest in things that are eternal. But we can say that and also say in the same breath, your membership is not attached to your financial contributions to us. We trust that you, as a child of God, seeking to follow God's calling in your life, will seek to honor God with your finances. Our bodies. Your body does not belong to you. You don't own anything. God owns everything. So this is a radical notion to wrap our heads around in the society in which we live, that we don't own our bodies. This has the power to really revolutionize the way you approach such topics as human sexuality, abortion, euthanasia. Or do you not know, 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, 
that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. If we understand this principle, then our, it goes from birth to death. So yeah, the, the child in your womb is not yours, and your womb is not yours. All of it belongs to God, and we are to steward the life and the body that God has given us, all the way to the end of life. And so the complex conversations around end of life and euthanasia, then this is informed by the fact that my body is not my own. I am a steward of the body that God has given me, and it is His body. It, affects, it directly applies in these verses, you can see, to how we engage in our sexuality with the bodies that God has given us. And so the idea that we are stewards of our own bodies is an important one to flesh out. Our children, and we're not going to go into all these categories that we could go into, our children are a gift from God. We have the responsibility to steward this gift from God and, and educate them and, and teach them and to invest in them and to train them up into who God wants them to be. And we could go down so many different roads here. We could say, we could plug environment into this. This world that we have been given is not our own. And we are called to be good stewards of the environment. You could plug in the gospel message. The gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ and the salvation that he has come to give to the world, we are stewards of. And it is our responsibility to steward that well and to invest that message into the lives of others. And so this is the, the, the underlying principle of stewardship we think is very, very important. We must understand this underlying principle so that we can steward all the things God has given us. One of which also is our vocation or our calling. But we're going to talk about vocation. So my vocation extends the order, goodness, and grace of God to others. Now, vocation in our, con in our present day society is often attached to the idea of what we do nine to five, our work. But what we want to see here is that it is bigger than our work. If you go back to the roots, language, the root language of the word comes from the Latin, and it is bigger than just our work. It is, and as we flesh out this illustration, I think it will explain it better. God wants to extend order, goodness, and grace to the world in which he's created. So you go all the way back to Adam and Eve, and you look at the vocation, the calling that God has put on the lives of Adam and Eve. He wanted them to manage the garden, to continue to provide order to his creation, provide goodness to his creation and grace. How does God channel order, goodness, and grace to his creation? Well, he does it through my vocation. He does it through me and all of the people in my network. And so I am a conduit of God's order, goodness, and grace. And that goes out to my family, to my co-workers, to strangers, to neighbors, to friends, and to as you can imagine, exponentially, as we could fill out this chart, I am the channel of God's order, goodness, and grace to all the different people that I run into in my life. I think this next chart helps us see it um, all the more. The work of a Christ follower. So you have many vocations. So this, we are those conduits in various settings. And so one of them, what I am called to do, compelled by God to do, um, this is all mapped out according to the author of the book we referenced earlier, Tim Challies, in Visual Theology. This is him filling in some of these blanks. So he would say that he's a counselor, a pastor, a Christian, and a church member. These are things that he has been called by God to do. And we could fill in these dots for ourselves. Things that we have been called by God to do. In those environments, those are our vocations. Although we also have passions, what I love and pursue, gifted by God. And so for him, he's saying artist, musician, and athlete. For you, it may say um, other things. And so the blessing of life oftentimes is whenever these dots can overlap. For example, uh, personally, a passion I have is, is to um, 
write and to speak. And so that overlaps with the calling God has put upon my life as a pastor. And so I get to do both of those things, and there's overlap. And that's where we really find really sweet spots in some of our lives, through, and we really appreciate the blessing of God when those overlaps happen, because then our calling overlaps with our passions, and it's just a, a joy to get up and, let's say, go to work in the morning. But for many of us, those those circles don't overlap. There are other things, too, like the idea of being, what I am, what I've been placed by God. And so that is where the idea that we are also, our vocation is to be a citizen of the United States. We are a neighbor on our streets. We are a husband to our wife. We are a father to our children. And you could fill this out with so many other things, but it's supposed to illustrate that we have many vocations. And where the overlap exists, it is the sweetness and goodness of God that he has allowed that. So this also helps, though, when we think of the fact of, um, for example, a woman who is incredibly skilled and gifted and qualified and passionate in an area where perhaps she could be the CEO of a great company, and yet she finds herself um, at home with her children, um, folding socks and putting bandages on, on owies and cooking dinner for the family in the evening. Well, the she provides order to the household as she organizes the sock drawer. She imparts goodness to the child as she bandages the boo boo, and she extends grace to her husband as she prepares the meal for him as she comes home. So it may not be all that she is, but it is nonetheless extending the order, goodness, and grace of God. And it's only one part of who she is. She is also exists in all these other vocations. So hopefully it, it keeps us from putting too much significance onto any one of these areas of our life and attaching our identity wholly to that. And it also empowers those of us who are stuck in a vocation that doesn't bring us the fulfillment that we wish it would. We can see that we are not just that thing we are also many other ways conduits of God's goodness, grace, and order. So hopefully that helps humble those of us who have put too much identity into a particular vocation, and hopefully that empowers those of us who are trapped in a vocation that we never really intended to be in. Um, I think it's a really helpful um, visual and, and explanation of it that comes from the book Visual Theology. And so we as Northgate Church want to know who you are as the leaders of Northgate Church and you a member of Northgate Church. We want to know who you are, what your passions are, what your calling is, who you are, so that we can help you live into those callings, so that we can help you be a good steward of who God has called you to be. You can be a good steward on your street with the neighbors that God has put around you. Who are those people? How can we help you be a light to those people? So you have a passion as a musician. Well, that's wonderful. How can we help you be a good steward of that gift and that passion you have to play the guitar? And we will say, you know what? One way you could do that is to play in our church, in our services, and that would be a blessing. But we also want to know how can you steward that in our city and in our culture and in our society in which we're in. And so there certainly is always an idea of recruitment within the local church because we want to provide opportunities for families to to come and let their children learn about God and, and for men to connect in ways that are appropriate and women and families. So there is always the idea of the church has needs that we're trying to fill. But we want to think bigger than that as Northgate Church. We want to think whole life discipleship and how can we help root that in. Now another thing that God has called us um, with and we must be a good steward of so we've said, as we've already seen, we want to be good stewards of our finances, of our body, of our children, of the environment, of the gospel, and we could fill in of our calling, of our, of our vocations. We want to be good stewards of all of these things. And another category is we want to be good stewards of the spiritual gifts that God has given us. And so we just want to walk through um, Northgate Church's understandings of the spiritual gifts again. We touched on this briefly in week one. But what we have here is a little chart that may be helpful and it may be a little bit confusing potentially as well that has mapped out the spiritual gifts in the five primary spots that are listed in the New Testament. 
And so with the list that we have here, Romans 12, 6 to 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and Ephesians 4, 11 are all written by the Apostle Paul. And then 1 Peter 4, 11 is written by Peter. And we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at Peter's list of speaking and serving. We're going to spend most of the time here looking at the list that Paul put together and trying to understand how Paul put some of these lists together. We've already talked about in our doctrinal statement that our particular view of the spiritual gifts is that they um, were for, some of the gifts were for a special time and a special purpose um, through the works of the apostles for the foundation of the church. And we understand that, that good Christian people disagree with us on that, and that's fine. We're just going to explain here how we come to our conclusion and how we manage that conclusion, if you will. So there's a couple of different ways. There's a number of different ways to look at it. One way is to think of them as there are miraculous gifts, enabling gifts, and ministry gifts. So miraculous gifts would be gifts that are limited in need and use. So miraculous gifts would be things like the apostles, the tongues, interpretation of tongues, healings, miracles. And so key to that understanding is the verse that I was just quoting from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, which I'll just read it directly from the word here. It says um, in verse 19, so then you are no longer you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So we see that we see the concept here that there is a foundational level of the church, there's a which was built upon the apostles and the prophets. And so they would have had miraculous gifts that were for a limited need and use. And so we see those verse those being listed out in 1 Corinthians 12, I mean 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8 to 10, as well as in 1 Corinthians 12:12. 12, 12. Um and so if you look up on your chart, you'll see 1 Corinthians 13 8 to 10, or I'm sorry, these, uh, these are the, the our uh, references are, are wrong here on our sheet, that, or on the screen that you're looking at. It should say 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 8 to 10. Yeah, never mind. 1 Corinthians Right. Pardon my confusion for just a moment there. Miraculous gifts. Enabling gifts. Qualities which all Christians have the ability to develop. So if there are miraculous gifts, limited in need and use, we also see enabling gifts. Qualities which all Christians have the ability to develop. And those we would see as faith, discernment, wisdom, and knowledge. So those are qualities which all Christians would have the ability to develop. So we can all have deeper spiritual gifts of faith, discernment, wisdom, knowledge. And then we see a different category, which is ministry gifts, activities you perform or roles that you fill. This would be things like the evangelist, prophet, teacher, exhorter, pastor, shepherd, mercy shower, server, giver, administrator. So we look at the gifts and we see that they seem to fit into three different categories. Miraculous gifts, which are limited in need and use, such things as tongues and healings and miracles. Enabling gifts, which we can all develop deeper levels of faith, discernment, wisdom, knowledge. And then ministry gifts, things that we do. Teaching, exhorting, shepherding, showing mercy, serving. So each of us have of one of these gifts, um, those of us who are in the church. But there's another way of looking at it, too, which would fit within the framework of Northgate Church, and that's where the color coding comes in. If you look at the list that Paul made, one of the theories is, is that in Ephesians 4.11, he was listing off office gifts. What we mean by that is gifts that were given to those who serve the church at large, which would be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These would be roles that, that would be in leadership serving the church at large. And then he also listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, special gifts, miraculous gifts, given to meet a momentary need and validate the message of Christianity. So that as you look down through 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, another way of interpreting it is to say that the, that is when in that section Paul was listing off the miraculous gifts. Whereas in Ephesians 4, 11, he was listing off 
the office gifts or the gifts given to the church, those who serve the church at large. And then in Romans 12, 6 through 8, he was giving a list of the service gifts, the non-miraculous gifts that correspond to ministries that all of us should do. But some are gifted in greater ways of doing them. And so that would be prophecy, serving, teaching, exhorting, giving, leading, and showing mercy. And so the this interpretation of it it tries to make sense of, of Paul, why Paul lists some things in some verses and other things in other verses. And so the theory goes, Ephesians 4.11, gifts that are given to the leaders of the church. In the pink column, 1 Corinthians 12.8-10, gifts there he's listing are special gifts that are miraculous. And then in Romans 12.6-8, gifts that are um, non-miraculous that all of us should do, but some of us are gifted in greater ways. Meaning that the white column in the center, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, is a comprehensive list. Paul lumps all the various types of gifts together into one list as he summarizes and closes out chapter 12. Whichever way you want to come at it, option A, saying that it's miraculous gifts versus enabling gifts versus ministry gifts, or option B, if you want to look at this color coding and look at it that way, both would correspond with Northgate's understanding of the spiritual gifts. Uh, we do want to just make the disclaimer, too, that Northgate in no way is saying that God no longer does miracles or um, uh, does healings or anything like that. We believe that God continues to work miracles, and he, and he heals people, and he works in miraculous ways. We just believe that, a, that the, the time for individuals to receive sp special miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit was time was during a time for the foundation of the church, which has passed. And um, while God still does miracles, we're just simply saying he doesn't give the spiritual gift of miracles. Um, if that doesn't make sense to you, you'd like to talk more at length to that, we'd love to have those conversations with you and, and uh, explain our position. It's a position that we hold with humility, with the understanding that um, we see in a mirror dimly, uh, but one day we will see face to face, and one day we will have clarity on all these um, uh, particular topics within Christianity. So last week we we gave out in the course uh, a a tool that you can use to understand what your spiritual gift is. And so if you've taken that, that's wonderful, and we can talk to you more about that. Northgate Church would love to know what your spiritual gift is, so that we can help you be a good steward of that spiritual gift. But that's, that's what we wanted to cover in this particular session. Just to recap, we wanted you to understand the strategy that North Cape Church comes at church uh, and the great task that God has left us with. We want to, our strategy is, is to equip the members to do the work of the ministry in every area that they're called into. Because every area of life is a question of stewardship. And so how can you steward your money, your body, your children, your environment, your the gospel message and how can you steward your calling and your passions and how can you steward your spiritual gifts those are the kinds of of uh, questions we want you to be asking as a member of Northgate Church because our responsibility as leaders of the church as pastors and elders is we want to help you become equipped to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in a, on mission mode in this world and the best way you can do that is to live it out in every different pocket of your life. On your street, in your family, at your workplace, around the dinner table. And so that's what it means to be a member of Northgate Church. And that is what we as a church, that's the commitment that we as a church are making to you. And so that is um, how we close out um, our third session. We hope that these have been helpful to you and you have a clear understanding of who we are as a church how we can serve you, how you can serve us, and we're always happy to continue the conversation. And now i got to figure out how to close this session.